And so in this context of a more nuanced understanding of tyranny, please permit me to tell you a personal story. About two years ago, I gave a press interview in which I said that the Catholic Church in Nigeria had become too much about money. Any honest-minded person knows this is true. It is flagrantly, self-evidently true in so many churches all over this country. And the point of calling this out is so that church leaders might curtail this unchristian practice, which is driving people away from attending services. Anyway, this criticism of mine appeared to upset quite a few church leaders, not all of them, because I think it is important to note that there are a few notable church leaders who are able to acknowledge the truth in constructive criticism. But it takes just one leader who is unable to take criticism to taint, to taint the perception one has of all leaders. Some months after I gave that interview, my mother died very unexpectedly. And this not long after my father had also died unexpectedly. In fact, I had by this time forgotten about that interview. But the priest in my hometown, a man called Christopher Eze, had not. <laughs> and so, and so at my mother's funeral, while my siblings and I sat in the front pew, our minds still in disbelief and our hearts broken with grief, this priest began to crudely and verbally attack me for daring to criticize the church. Later, his bishop, his superior, who apparently was also upset that I had dared to criticize the church for being materialistic, supported this priest. I spoke privately to a number of Catholics I respected about this incident, the sort of people who speak out boldly about government corruption. And I was struck by how quick all of them were to tell me, don't talk publicly about this. Don't go public. A friend, who is no longer a friend, <laughs> who, is, who is also very outwardly religious, told me that he would take me so that we could go and beg the bishop, so that the bishop would reprimand the priest, but quietly, behind closed doors, hush, 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 for the sake of peace. But I was not asking for peace. I was asking for justice. I, I wanted the bishop to do the right thing, to take responsibility, to reprimand the priest in the same public way that the priest had desecrated my mother's funeral, to set a precedence for consequences, and therefore make sure that no other priest would turn what is often one of the saddest days of a person's life into a venue for settling petty scores. Anyway, that did not happen. I can tell you that as I stand here, I am still filled with a shimmering, glowering, unending rage. But why did I choose to tell you this story? Because it made me realize how often in this country we sweep aside injustice in the name of peace. but it is always a fragile and hollow peace. 
Because as long as we refuse to untangle the knots of injustice, real peace cannot thrive. And so, and so in the name of peace, we say things like, okay, just leave it. Okay, it's enough now. Okay, it was very bad, but you should just stop talking about it. Okay, just manage it now, we don't do. And by saying these, we continue to make mediocrity our norm. We fail to hold leaders accountable, and we turn... <laughs> and, and, We, we fail to hold leaders accountable and we turn what should be transparent systems into ugly, opaque cults. My experience also made me begin to think that there is something dead in us, something dead in our society. A death of self-awareness, a death of self-reflection, a death of compassion, a death of intellectual curiosity, a death of the ability for self-criticism. And I think it is time for a collective resurrection, so to speak. We cannot refuse to practice self-criticism and yet criticize the government. We cannot ignore the abuses by our religious, our traditional, our community leaders, and focus only on the abuses of political leaders. We cannot want to hide our own institutional failures while demanding transparency from government institutions. The first question we must ask is, what is the right thing to do? Not what is the materially beneficial thing to do, or what is the institutionally beneficial thing to do, but what is the right thing to do? Because if we do not do this, if we continue to sweep away injustice for the sake of a hollow peace, then we will leave behind for our children and their children an utterly bleak inheritance. Many, many Nigerians are disillusioned with our justice system. They believe that justice is for sale, that we can buy justice. And they have reason to believe this. They have seen the strange judgments in the courts, whether they be on election cases or commercial cases, which do not stand the test of fairness or the test of legal reasoning.